Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning. Bienvenue à notre première journée d'Econou 2018. It is our first full day of the conference. Je suis à tel côté, je suis une des maîtres de cérémonie pendant l'ensemble de la conférence, mais je partage ce rôle avec des représentants et des représentantes de toutes les organisations partenaires de la conférence. Today I'm very grateful because I'm sharing the stage with a, a friend, a colleague, a collaborator from the movement. So I'm joined with David Upton from the Social Enterprise Network of Nova Scotia. And welcome, David. Morning, Adele. How are you? How are you? Good morning, thank you. I'm well. Good. We, we, try, we, we come back a few minutes ago and I asked him, so what did you like from yesterday? And you, told, you talked to me right away to the, about the politics. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like, you know, like, it's like crashing an election. <laughs> it was kind of fun to, to, to drop in and, and uh, watch the, what, what is a fascinating kind of uh, mm -hmm. uh, experiment that I'm about to, about to go on in New Brunswick. I can't imagine that any of us can predict absolutely how it's going to turn out. It was so uh, close and the impact of that kind of election, it's, it will be, no, it will have impact in the community for sure. And I think we're seeing it more and more across the country that there's less and less certainty about about the direction, or at least the direction that we've been on. And I think I think it all ties well into this conference. Oh yeah, that's for sure. We need to talk about it and be more strategic, probably in some strategies. But uh, I, I know we've been through it in Ontario. We are on that yeah, well, working stage <laughs> to reconnect with the government. But the thing is, I know uh, yesterday you were not there, but most of us were there. And, um, you know, there's a fine line throughout the conference so far about storytelling. And, you know, we've been to so many conferences, you and me, and so many meetings, and sometimes, all of us, we, we won't agree on definition. We will argue so badly. But when we are sharing our practice, when we are sharing our story, we really connect. We really understand each other. We really understand the impact of our work. And yesterday, we had many stories telling uh, at the first panel, and I know today it's a streamlined throughout the conference, and you are a good storyteller. You're one of the most <laughs> passionate guys who speak about the work. So you're the Social Enterprise Network of Nova Scotia. Can you say a few things about it? Sure. The, the network was formed uh, three years ago to advocate on behalf of, of the sector, of, of, of the social enterprise sector, of the social innovation sector in Nova Scotia. And, and um, it's a member-driven organization. It's a nonprofit. Uh, Kathy Eagle Gammon from Dartmouth Adult Services is the is the president of the organization, and uh, in a very short period of time, that organization was able to uh, sit with uh, the provincial government, and negotiate a strategy, and have a framework released. Um, and it was a commitment from uh, eight or ten individuals, many of whom are in the room, who to to stand up and make a difference, and to and to work through what were some of our obvious uh, differences to get to a sort of a more common, uh, uh, commonly uh, uh, desired outcome. And, and I, think, I think it was a great first step, and uh, uh, we're already talking about the next iteration of the strategy and how we're going to do that. And for Bree and Megan from the province sitting over there, yeah, we're coming to visit again soon. <laughs> oh, that's great. And if I would ask you, what are you proud, the most proud of during the last year work you're, you've been doing in the country, not only in your neck of the wood, but throughout the country in the, in the movement building? You uh, didn't expect that. No, that's the unscripted moment. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I, think, I think the thing that I'm most proud of are the young men and women that I get to work with every day. Mm -hmm. um, at, at our place, we have fabulously talented, passionate, committed young men and young women who are, are going to change the world. And, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it's a, uh, I'm reminded of Wendell Berry. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, Wendell Berry's a, an American poet and, and he said, uh, our job is to plant sequoias, knowing that we're not going to live to see the harvest. And uh, some days it kind of feels like I'm going to work to do that, you know? Uh, and these people that are, that are being seeded into the sector are, are going to do things that I can't even imagine. So it's exciting. That, that, that keeps me getting up in the morning. Oh, that's great. And uh, this morning, you will moderate a panel, an incredible panel, uh, a, a propos de l'innovation sociale et de la finance sociale. And uh, you will have a chance to have a few people 
talking with you about the opportunities, social innovation and social finance is uh, presenting to art. And uh, just before I gave you the baton for, to moderate that, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, you remember I talk about, and there's a many new people this morning, so some of you will remember, some of you it, it's brand new information, but we have Econos team member throughout the, uh, the room. Can you wave? Econos uh, team member, yeah, great. So if you have any question during the conference, you know what, it's your conference. We want to make it memorable to each and every one of us in this room. If you have questions, don't hesitate. Go to any of, the, <coughs> of us and ask the question and we'll make sure you have the right information at the right time to really benefit to this conference. Uh, you have also your program. And there's a few sessions which, uh, changed during the, the last few days. So I know we, most of you probably selected a workshop or a few workshops or a few sessions, but pick the one you really, really want to be in. Uh, you can move around, but the thing is, we had a few new sessions, and maybe you will be attracted with some of them. Uh, as you can see, I'm a, it's, is it a good English day for me today? My English is okay? <laughs> Okay, phew, okay, I'm okay. <laughs> I have good and bad days, but at least people understand me today. Uh, but the thing is, we will have some French speaking through panel, but also there are some workshop wars with simultaneous translation. But to benefit that kind of resources, we need those translation device. And usually I, I say headset or headphone, but uh, please do pr procure your one. It's uh, just behind the door over there and uh, you'll need it. You know, language could be a barrier, but language could be also a connection amongst us if we find a ways to overcome that barrier. And we are change makers, and we found solutions to overcome so many barriers. The language shouldn't be one. And we can learn from each other throughout the country, and that's what is happening at a CED conference. So let's overcome that. And usually we miss to thank those people who help us to overcome that barrier. And I will say thank you right now to the translator, and I want you to support them. Thank you so much. And also another group of people we always forget, the technician. You know, if you hear us, it's because they are there. And David, I think we gave you some task also about some news. Yeah, no such thing as a free podium session. Um, <laughs> So the, so the sessions in the room are being recorded. Uh, we'll be sharing the recording, or Ikunu will be sh uh, sharing the recording as soon as, the, as, soon as they're available, uh, so you can share them with people you think would appreciate the discussions. Um, for this particular session, if you're uh, interested in asking a question, uh, you can share your question on social media, or you can write your questions on a sheet of paper at your tables, uh, and we'll come around to collect the questions towards the end of the panel. And we'll use two mic also, and I will be in the room too if people want to ask their question uh, lively. Exactly. So, Atel and uh, Patrick, maybe? I Barb, know. I think. You'll uh, be oh, with sorry. me. Hello. Hi. We'll, we'll be around uh, afterwards. Um, and, and I'm going to ask that you take a moment to look at the back of your program guide. That's you all looking at it, right? Yeah. Um, there are links to places you can share what you're learning, including the Facebook event page. Uh, the LinkedIn wall, and of course, Twitter hashtag, uh, hashtag equalnew2018. So let's get equalnew trending mm. on Twitter. Uh, let's see if we can overtake the election results in New Brunswick, because that's, <laughs> just in case people are tired of the single theme of the day. Um, and the Wi-Fi code is indicated on your program. Mm. And I will give you the stage. Over to you as a moderator of this panel, and David. Have yep. fun. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, so I uh, um, uh, had the, I don't know what the word is, opportunity to, to be involved with the development of the uh, strategy that was, uh, the recommendations that were made to the federal government around social innovation and social finance. The committee was made up of 17, 16 people from community from across the country. Um, we're fortunate enough today to have um, David LePage with us. David, if you'd come up, and Francine White Duck and Marie Bouchard. If you guys would just come up to the stage, I'll, uh, and there we go. Thank you.
Which one was that? I know. I told you. So, um, yeah. Thank you. So I, uh, if you look at this first slide, social innovation, social finance strategy, or SISFS.ca, or as we affectionately got to call it, Sisyphus. <laughs> and um, never, never I'm, going to ta I'm going to take credit for this joke, but it was uh, David LePage. But it, I didn't want him to get all the credit, so I, I put it up first. And when we, he and I were talking yesterday, he told me some of the things he was going to say, and I said, well, I'm getting up first, so I'm going to say them all, and then I'm going to point to him and say, and what do you got? So uh, uh, this was my little token. <laughs> Cheers, David. <laughs> um, so the work, all the kidding aside, the work was, uh, um, the work was challenging, the work was uh, um, uh, complex, and the, the conversation around, around regions and pan-Canadian sort of approach, Canada is not a single entity in the sense that it's made up of entities. And, and it was a fascinating conversation about a pan-Canadian approach to, to the work that we did. And, and so we're really fortunate today in that the, the panelists that we have represent uh, uh, our country, I think, geographically, and I think they represent our country uh, uh, from perspective of, 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 of viewpoints. So we have, we have uh, David LePage on, on, on the far right, and David's the managing uh, partner of BiSocial Canada. Uh, BiSocial, BiSocial Canada is a partner in the social enterprise uh, institute and principal with accelerating social impact. Uh, David provides direct support and strategic advice to blended value businesses, social enterprises, and social finance developments generally. He is involved in multiple public policy initiatives and research projects that support social enterprise ecosystem across Canada. His other current roles include founding member and chair of the Social Enterprise Council of Canada, chair of the board of directors of the Social Enterprise World Forum, instructor at Groundswell Social Venture Incubator. He's a member of the Canadian CED Network Policy Council, a member of Imagine Canada's uh, Sector Pulse Committee. He's a, uh, a program adjunct in the MBA at Social Enterprise Leadership Program at the Sanderman School of Business. And previously, David was the team manager at Enterprising Nonprofits. David's a, a, a vampire. He doesn't need to sleep. He just works day and night. Um, next on the, uh, uh, on, on coming from uh, my right towards me, is uh, Marie Bouchard. Uh, Marie Bouchard is a full professor at the École de Sciences uh, de la Gestion at the University of Quebec at Montréal. Uh, she holds a doctorate in so sociology from École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales de Fran à France. Um, she's been a member of the Centre of Research um, for Innovation uh, so Sociale since 1995, where she is currently managing the social innovation and collective enterprises research area. She was the university officer for the Community Housing Project of the Community University Research Alliance in the social economy from 2009 into 2010. She was also Canada Research Chair in Social Economy from 2003 to 2013. In 2008, Marie published a statistical portrait of Montreal's social economy, and in 2011, she completed a conceptual framework for the Institute de la Statistique de Quebec. In 2017, she also completed a conceptual framework for the uniformization of statistics and cooperative for cooperatives, on cooperatives for the International Labor Office. Since 2015, she has chaired the Commission uh, Social and Cooperative Economy of the International Center of Research and Information on the Public, Social, and Cooperative Economy. Again, these are really qualified people um, who, who have deeply understand the work that we're, we're doing. In, uh, in this country. <clears throat> Francine White Duck, uh, who's sitting closest to me, is founder of White Duck uh, Resources, a company with national and international research, uh, international reach through a network of joint initiatives, project partnerships, and associates. WRI works in business, economic, educational, and social development disciplines with a particular emphasis on women's development and on projects that apply an impact investing mission critical lens. Since beginning the company, uh, WRI and its partners have supported and led projects with broad social and environmental purposes, such as the 2008 to 13 Gender Mainstreaming Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, 
uh, the uh, SME Women in Trade Initiative pilot designed to ensure inclusion of rural, remote, and indigenous women in trade and the development of export markets. Recently, Francine started Breakthrough Growth Accelerator, a project designed to engage organizations and support youth and others in international, social, and environmental enterprise pursuits that disrupt long-standing systemic barriers. Francine currently serves as a Prosper Canada board member, which is a nonprofit board with a focus on developing financial empowerment and literacy for Canadians. She has served as a member of the Employment Services Development Canada Social Innovation Social Finance Steering Committee group, and she is board governance ICD certified through the Institute of Corporate Directors. In 2009, Francine was awarded the World of Difference Award by the International Alliance of Women for her contributions to the economic advancement of women, and 2017 was honored with the Bank of Montreal Award for Community Development and Charitable Giving. Francine is an Algonquin from the Kitigan Ziba Anishinaabe uh, First Nation. I, uh, I, I'll see if this works. Three million families in Canada, both rural and urban, live in poverty. 570,000 of us lack reliable access to clean drinking water. Then there's the correction system, where Indigenous people represent 28% of those in prison, but only 4% of our total population. And these are only a few of our environmental and social challenges. But what if people facing these challenges had the resources to solve them? What if our system was more flexible to allow innovation for the common good? What if there was collaboration across sectors to build a sustainable and prosperous future for us all? What if the tools already exist? You heard of social innovation. Social innovation is about leveraging our bright ideas and novel approaches to help society achieve better outcomes. And what about social finance? Social finance is investing for social or environmental impact in addition to financial returns. Many organizations, like credit unions and cooperatives, nonprofits and charities, and social enterprises, are already using it. Governments and the private sector, too. Take Aki Energy. As a social enterprise, it emphasizes social value creation through marketplace endeavors. Aki Energy partners with First Nations to install geothermal energy in their communities. Manitoba Hydro finances the cost of installation up front and recoups their investment through a small financing fee placed on the energy bill. This money not only saves money for communities and reduces environmental impact, it harnesses the capacity of First Nations people through social enterprise development, local training, and employment opportunities. Aki Energy has already installed $8 million worth of geothermal energy on five Manitoba First Nations. Over the past year, the federal government hosted a unique consultation process, engaging innovators, investors, and social purpose organizations across sectors. There was widespread acknowledgement for the need of a social innovation and social finance strategy. In this strategy, we call upon the government to work with the charitable sector to ensure an enabling legal and regulatory environment. Organize better access to markets and capital. Support the use of emerging technologies for the social good. Focus resources on community-based problem solvers with a view to national systems change. And develop social impact measurements and tools to share learning about what works. Countries around the world are already making ambitious investments to stimulate social innovation and social finance for better outcomes. And Canada can't lag behind. We are not asking the government to do more. We're asking the government to do different. Help contribute to Canada's bright future by sharing this video and asking your MP to support the social innovation and social finance strategy. Thank you. So that short video was, uh, was scripted by a young woman, Hilary Angrove, who's a, a, a bilingual Albertan studying law at Dalhousie University in Halifax. 
Uh, she spent the summer uh, working at Common Good Solutions to, to push out information on the recommendations and uh, the video was done uh, with the amazing hand drawing of a young woman named Rachel Dara uh, from Halifax as well and, and a company called Brave Space. Uh, Rachel's from New Brunswick. Um, so, so the work that, that uh, we're going to do today is to uh, <clears throat> entice you to come to a deeper dive this afternoon. We're, we're going to talk about our experiences and, and the things about which we feel strongly as a result of the work we did over the past year and a half <clears throat> in this session here. But this afternoon, there's going to be a deeper dive. For those of you who are really interested in what the next steps are, how you can become involved in, 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 in planning for implementation, assuming that the federal government decided to go ahead, then uh, uh, check your, your, your agendas. And I think it's at 1.15 this afternoon. There's another session where you can really get into it. So um, those are the 12 recommendations. Uh, that only took about a half a million bucks and, and about a gajillion hours of work. Um, it doesn't seem like much, does it? Uh, but I, I think what I'm going to ask right now is for, for uh, David to come up and talk about, about the thing for him that, that uh, resonated most strongly and, and emphasize the things that he thinks uh, uh, you should be thinking about as you go through your day. Thank you. No, you can do it from wherever you'd like. Thanks. Now that you took away my lead line of Sisyphus, um, <laughs> no more debriefing and preparing for workshops. Um, I think one of the things that for me <clears throat> was really fascinating in reflecting back on, on the entire process is that when we began, I think in one of the first meetings, I pointed out to, to the participants in the the group, that this was a piece in a very, very long story, that we were running a marathon. And sometimes when you're running a marathon, you actually get to go downhill with the wind at your back. And so we actually had about seven months where we all worked together with a lot of encouragement and support. And so we got the thing moved, but it was really built on you know, when you think back to, you know, Sednet's 20 years of working on these policies, this Canadian Community Economic Development Network constantly pushing this, uh, the Social Enterprise Council of Canada creating a framework over 10 years ago. So some of this is, is really, really important, I think, to put in perspective. And in talking to the Policy Council of Sednet a couple weeks ago, I said, if you look at these recommendations and you said to someone, put the word CED in front of every one of those recommendations, you would actually have a really great community economic development strategy for Canada. So I think we have to, to look at this as a real opportunity in terms of moving the ecosystem. And I think that's what's really, really important. Throughout, ever since the recommendations came out, everyone keeps saying, so what's the most important one? <clears throat> and we've been really, really clear. There is not a most important recommendation, it really is, and I think someone from the public service uh, defined it really well when they kept getting pushed on this and she said, no, no, it's not a set of recommendations, it is a thing. So we have to think about this as a whole. David's asked us to point out some of the things that we think are important from our own perspectives and as the working for many years now in the procurement area and looking at the opportunities of market, of course, one of the things I would point to where the recommendations are really, really strong is really an emphasis on putting some resources into both government and intermediaries and the sector to take advantage of market opportunities. When we look at the fact that the federal government spends 18 to $20 billion a year buying goods and services, that's a lot of money. When we look at the fact that the federal government over the next 10 years is going to spend $180 billion on infrastructure, that's a lot of money. That's $36 billion over the next 10, year, 10 years. So I'm not very good at math, as a lot of people know. 10% of that's $3.6 billion per year. I think that's a good target. So if we could spend $3.6 billion a year of federal money on buying from social enterprises and cooperatives, I think we could move a, move a dial. So I think that's really important to think about how can we take advantage of the spending. And that was what was really good in the video. 
We're not talking about government spending more money. We're talking about government spending money better. And if we're spending $36 billion a year on goods and services and infrastructure, there has to be benefits for communities. And, and I think if we look at this social innovation, social finance strategy as a whole, that builds capacity, creates access to financing, creates access to markets, and learns and networks together, we actually have an amazing set of opportunities. Um, and I just have one little note for everyone to take. So there were um, 16 people plus one government people person on the committee, right? There were 12 recommendations. So at least four of us agreed on a couple things. Uh, thank you, David. Um, we're, we're just going to go, well, actually, I'm going to ask you to go last, Francine. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Marie, would you care to, to, to go next? Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit disconcerting. I'm not used to that. Bonjour. Uh, merci beaucoup de nous avoir donné cette tribune et d'être uh, aussi bien réveillé ce matin pour uh, écouter ces choses uh, qui... Uh, sont disponibles dans un document que vous pouvez lire. Hein. Si vous avez oublié votre livre de chevet euh, cette nuit, vous pourrez euh, lire ces documents. Euh, mais je vais faire comme euh, avec mes étudiants, je vais vous le résumer. <rire> en fait, euh, c'est 99 pages, 12 recommandations, 6 domaines d'intervention et 7 principes de conception. Une fois la numérologie euh, donnée, euh, tout le monde sait ici et ce n'est pas Albert Einstein qui l'a inventé, mais c'est quand même lui qui l'a dit, « Ce qui compte le plus ne se compte pas. » Alors, je vais vous en parler de manière plus qualitative. Il y a des principes, et je crois que David voulait parler de la subsidiarité. Dans les sept principes, il y a la subsidiarité, il y a la complémentarité, il y a la co-création. C'est là-dessus que je vais essayer de dire un mot. Sur euh, le principe de la complémentarité, je vais vous citer l'une des recommandations. Les recommandations rendent compte et tirent parti des connaissances et des efforts actuels des régions, provinces et territoires, ainsi que des collectivités. Autrement dit, ces recommandations-là, ce n'est pas de faire table rase de ce qui existe, mais bien de construire sur ce qui existe déjà. Il existe déjà, un peu partout à travers le pays, dans, dans les collectivités, dans, dans les régions, des écosystèmes d'innovation sociale et de finances sociales et solidaires, dont vous êtes d'ailleurs un des pivots importants, les organismes de développement communautaire et le réseau que vous formez. Qu'est-ce qu'un écosystème? Je vais me baser sur l'expérience que j'ai au Québec d'un écosystème d'innovation sociale en économie sociale pour essayer de voir quelles en sont les composantes. Il y a évidemment du financement, puisque c'est une stratégie de finance sociale. Alors, ce qu'on a dans le financement, ce de particulier en innovation sociale, ce sont des financeurs engagés socialement, respectueux, patients et qui sont en mesure de développer des outils qui sont adaptés au processus d'innovation sociale et non pas seulement aux résultats ou aux impacts que c'est censé donner. L'innovation sociale, c'est un processus, et parmi les impacts, ce processus-là est, est important. Il y a du service aux entreprises, vous connaissez ça, du service aux organisations, essentiel puisque le soutien à ce type de processus requiert des spécialistes en innovation sociale, ce que vous êtes. On a besoin de formation, d'enseignement, entre autres parce que la finance sociale veut avoir de la mesure, de l'évaluation d'impact. Or, euh, si vous attendez que quelqu'un vienne de l'extérieur avec son savoir, vous donner la clé de l'évaluation d'impact, il est déjà trop tard. Il faut qu'on ait déjà commencé à comprendre ce que c'est et surtout, il faut ramener ce savoir-là vers les institutions d'enseignement qui, elles, vont enseigner des choses trop traditionnelles. Or, vous, vous savez comment les impacts se produisent. Les organismes qui produisent ces impacts savent comment ils se produisent. Et donc, il faut faire remonter ça vers l'enseignement et la formation en évaluation et en mesure d'impact. Et enfin, ça prend euh, 
un réseau de recherche, je vais prêcher pour ma paroisse, mais pas seulement la mienne, puisque dans la, dans la recherche, euh, on se base beaucoup sur les pratiques du terrain. En innovation sociale, c'est la base même des savoirs constitués qui sont euh, produits par les acteurs eux-mêmes. Donc, on parle de transfert, d'échange, de connaissances. Donc, l'idée qu'il y a des connaissances sur le terrain, sur ce qui se fait ailleurs, dans d'autres pays, l'idée de construire une intelligence collective et non pas d'avoir un savoir qui, qui est donné du haut et distribué vers le bas, de la tour d'ivoire vers le terrain. Mais enfin, comment ça fonctionne tout ça? Ça ne fonctionne pas juste avec ces composantes-là, ça fonctionne parce qu'il y a un système de gouvernance. La gouvernance, vous connaissez ça. C'est là où le, le pouvoir s'organise, c'est là où la coordination se fait. Or, dans un système d'innovation sociale, la gouvernance, elle est plurielle. Il n'y a pas quelqu'un qui a beaucoup d'argent ou qui a beaucoup de pouvoir qui dit aux autres quoi faire. Il y a une co-construction qui doit se faire. Elle est distribuée. Ce <coughs> n'est pas parce qu'on est petit qu'on n'a pas une voix. Ce n'est pas parce qu'on est une seule personne qu'on n'a pas notre voix. Et cette gouvernance, elle vise à faire des connexions entre les acteurs de l'écosystème, entre eux et avec les pouvoirs publics. Plutôt que de, de se faire imposer des choses, il faut se connecter et co-construire les choses. C'est le principe aussi de subsidiarité. La décision doit se prendre au niveau le plus pertinent pour l'acteur concerné par la décision. Des fois, c'est assez bas dans la hiérarchie sociale, lorsqu'on parle d'innovation sociale. Il y a le principe de complémentarité qui fait que les acteurs sont complémentaires entre eux. Ce qui me ramène à un autre des principes qu'on a mis dans, la fameux, dans nos 99 pages, que je vous évite de lire maintenant, mais que vous pourrez lire quand vous voudrez, le principe de co-création. Et je vous le lis. Le gouvernement mise sur la collaboration et sur la co-création avec les personnes les plus touchées par les recommandations. C'est donc à vous de jouer maintenant. On se revoit cet après-midi. Uh, there was no shortage of passion in the room over the last year and a half. It was a, a, a fascinating thing. <clears throat> I wanted to talk, we, uh, you might notice we're mostly not talking about the 12 uh, principles. It's, it's more about sort of the, the driving forces behind the 12 recommendations. <clears throat> Today, I wanted to talk about uh, the principle of subsidiarity. So the notion is of subsidiary is that placing resources in the hands of uh, the most competent authority closest to the problem trying to be solved. I don't know what happened, but somewhere along the way, uh, organizations and governments lost faith in their citizens. It's the idea that as individuals and communities, we can't be trusted to solve our own problems, so somebody has to come and fix it for us. For one, I'm damn sick of it. So subsidiarity was integrally placed in uh, as a thread through all of the work that we did. The idea being that uh, um, it, it has to be the end of important decisions all being made in Toronto, or for that matter, Halifax, or for that matter, Bathurst. I mean, if, if, if uh, uh, um, If the problem is in Dalhousie, in northern, it's a small town in northern New Brunswick, uh, where I spent some of my life, uh, <clears throat> having the problem solved from Bathurst or from Halifax or Toronto is illogical and, and, and wrong, just outright wrong. So, so what we've uh, uh, asked is that, and asked that people consider is that probably the citizens of Dalhousie are better situated to identify the real source of the problem and come up with the most appropriate solution for their community. And that the real gap is access to resources. So my hope for the strategy is that it comes out with strong statement about uh, communities being resourced to deal with their own challenges. And I think if you want to do something innovative, tip the triangle over so it doesn't run like this, but it runs the other way, and that we end up with 
with communities in charge of their own destinies. And there'll be mistakes, but it's hard for me to imagine that we could be making more mistakes putting the resources and uh, power in the hands of community than we have putting the resources and power in the hands of people who are far away from the problem. So for me, and my hope for all of you, is that as you go back to your lives, as you hear more about the social innovation, social finance strategy, that you're truly advocating for control over your own destiny. I think that would be the most innovative thing the federal government could do. And, uh, uh, and my hope is that we, we get there. Uh, I'm gonna ask Francine to come up next and do the last piece to close this thing off and then we're gonna take questions from the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, very nice to be here in, in uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge my friends, the, uh, the Mi'kmaq and the Maliseet, uh, who are in this territory and say um, it's very nice to be here and to acknowledge the elders who may be in the room. Um, so, I want to give you a little bit today about the Indigenous perspective that we heard in, during the consultations and um, what the strategy means for our community at the local community. Um, so, I'll just, I'll start off by talking a bit, uh, some of the consultation results. Um, we, we heard that really there, there has been uh, limited investment in communities to build this whole social innovation, social finance strategy. So we're, we're not even sure what it is yet. We think we've been doing some of it, but you know, the words and how we describe it and all of this, we're, we're still figuring that out. So it's gonna take some time. And in doing that, they had some cautions that they were uh, quite concerned about. Um, the first one being, it's just, this another flavor of the month scheme that they're trying to do with indigenous people. There's been a lot of them when we talk about federal funding and <clears throat> government involvement in our communities. So what does this mean? And, and how, do we, you know, how do we get past that? This is just a temporary thing that's gonna be you know, a new thing in five years. And we need to understand that. Um, as you heard one of the, or saw perhaps read, uh, one of the recommendation is that we should have some legislation. And again, it was another caution uh, by the indigenous people and, and our leaders who participated in some of the discussions was that um, legislation doesn't always work out so well for indigenous people. So let's be cautious when we talk about it. Let's really um, have some experience with this whole issue before we go down that road. And they certainly you know, didn't want to commit till they had that um, that full opportunity to understand what this all means. And finally, uh, I think the other caution that we heard was that we need to be clear on the relationship that we have with foundations and the role in our community. A lot of the uh, um, people we spoke with talked about our history with charities and, and government and residential schools. They, it didn't turn out so well. Um, so, you know, and they said, we, we got to be cautious here, we got to understand what we're doing. And um, <clears throat> after I've taught about it and listening to it, you know, we would be crazy not to be given that, that caution when, you know, we think about the experience we had. So overall, they said, let us define what social innovation and social finance is and could be, and let us develop it at our own pace and bring back how we want to build an ecosystem um, in, in our communities. So those, so those were the, the key messages that we heard and um, certainly appreciate their cautions. But at the same time, you know, it, it wasn't all doom and gloom. Um, they said, let's be cautious, but there's some great opportunity here. And um, what does it mean for our community? And for, for me, and, and this is my, interpretation of you know what I've been hearing and my experience. First of all, when we talk about implementing this strategy, it has to be disruptive. Um, we in the indigenous community have not been successful in changing outcomes and all the people working on trying to change outcomes, we haven't moved that needle much. So if we're going to really talk about being innovative and new and trying something that's never been done before in new ways with new models, we gotta disrupt the existing system. So that's gonna have an impact. 
and it's you know it's it's going to require that people really think differently about what they're um, what they're doing. But that social innovation, social finance, is an opportunity to reset things and really uh, establish completely new ways of doing things. And and some of the feedback I just heard recently, I want to just share this one with you. We just did a, a survey of high school students in, in the El, in Algonquin community. And their feedback was very interesting. They said, when we asked, what do, what do we need to change? They said, we have to stop being so exclusive. You create programs, and it's only for, for the Algonquin. And we don't even let the, the people from Rapid Lake, our, our Algonquin community, in on this. And we all hang out with non-Indigenous people, so we don't get to create with them. We don't get to find solutions because we're so exclusive, and we've got to change that. And when we talked about, well, it's due to the funding, they said, well, then show out the funding models and make, you know, make um, activities that are not funded so that we could include everybody. It was very heartening because, you know, they're, they're talking about inclusive, you know, being inclusive here. So when we start to think about those kind of comments and implication on how we fund things, it certainly has a big change. Um, the other, so, and, and that's, and what they were saying is co stop creating the structures that, that exclude everybody and those opportunities for everybody to go forward. Um, they also talked, <laughs> the other thing I think where we're going to see really cha real changes if we adopt this strategy and are successful, the outcomes are going to uh, be driven by local community-based uh, activity, which means local ownership, branding from the local community, and local accountability. This is where the foundation of activity is going to happen, and that's how we're going to see some change come about. Um, for example, there's a whole lot of efforts of national networks or regional organizations to begin certifying who's doing social impact work or who's being green and all these different types of um, labels that they, they put on when they're, they're trying to describe a, a, social, uh, um, a social enterprise or, or whatever. It's, it's the communities that should be deciding who those people are and who's doing that activity in their community. Um, they are the local people that should be endorsing that. They are the people that should be creating that activity in their, in, in their community, and they should be the people that are accountable for it. So, so when we start to think about those things, you know, that, that has a lot of implications for the type of pools of funds that we're talking about, and we are talking about establishing some funding here. So that's some of the, you know, another uh, one of the changes I think we're going, we we may see in our community and how this this will uh, change us. Yep. So lastly, it was it, the the last um, item was really attention to constituents, and that's the people, the parties that have an interest in the outcomes. Um, existing models are not as conducive as we like it to be to innovation. Um, the nature of innovation, it's fluid, it's unpredictable, it's, it's got long gestation periods before you see activities start to happen. And um, we need to, to really think about how we're defining those outcomes as small ecosystems that we're working in. So that's going to, uh, to, um, to be one of, I think, the bigger impacts that we see at the local level. So those are some of the observations that we were talking about. Um, certainly some of the um, changes I've seen working with a group of young people, True Breakthrough Growth, that's the accelerator I, I work with. Um, they, it, it, the experience I'm having is we don't fit anywhere. We don't even know what we are yet. We're, we're still evolving, we're having su some success. We just you know, got some uh, investment from the private sector, which is the last place I thought we would get it from. Um, but, but we're still trying to define what we are doing, even though we know, you know all the activity, you know, we, we're into tree planting, we're into organic gardening, we're into a lot of different activity as, as well as supporting local, local charitable activity. Um, 
all of these things are happening in this accelerator that, that, we, that is emerging, but it's not finished yet. And, and that is the nature of innovation. So we have to make some space for that to happen uh, in the models that we create. So I think that already impacts that. I'm hoping anyway that we'll see. Okay. So we're, we're free for questions. If anybody, we have about, about uh, 14 minutes. If anyone has questions, feel free to, uh, uh, to put them out. Um, David, there's one here. Okay. Can you introduce yourself? I'm sure. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Bethany Scott. I live up in Iqaluit in Nunavut, which is an area of great mystery to a lot of people, but we're there. And just to make a brief statement, Nunavut's got a pretty complex political and governance structure. And we do have um, a pretty robust um, Inuit uh, governance and political system in Nunavut. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because I'm a bit curious and a little bit concerned that I see, um, I saw a group mentioned on one of your slides, Inspire Nunavut, who is a group that is working, doing some work in our communities. Sorry, I'm actually a little bit, um, yeah. They're doing some work in our communities, but they don't represent Inuit, and they don't speak for Nunavumiut. And so I'm encouraged when I hear things like, you want to make sure local leaders are involved, that communities have control of their own destiny. So in order to do that, and if you're wanting to decolonize the system and talk about reconciliation, you should actually come up to Nunavut and speak to Inuit and not the people who are profiting off of them. Thank you. Um, as someone who uh, lived in Nunavut for a decade, um, I, I, I understand and believe that you just made the point that we we're trying to make and that is the notion that communities have to control the resources to make the best decisions for their, for their citizens. And that uh, um, our hope, my hope for sure, is that the recommendations that have been made will be accepted by the federal government and they will deploy resources in ways that allow for your communities and communities across the country to, to manage their affairs in the way that most suit them. Thank you. Just, um, just to acknowledge, certainly, we hear so much about reconciliation. And I, you know, in my community, nobody talks about that. <laughs> and at the local level, it's, it's, it has meaning, but it's not, you know, nobody's going around saying, let's reconcile and do all these things. It's, it, it's the activity that the people do at the local level, the ownership that they have, the, the meaning and the value that's given to what activity they do, that is how we talk about reconciliation. Um, and certainly uh, agree that, you know, it has to be, and, and that's why, you know, I'm saying it has to be really community oriented with the people that are part of that community. We have, um, and we, we need to understand reconciliation at our level first. We have to do it at our, at our level with our people, with our values and all of these things before we can break that out into a bigger discussion. So that that means a lot of local involvement. There's another one on this side. Paul, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, Paul Sava with Co-ops and Mutuals Canada. Um, I'm working with a group of Indigenous artists out of Alberta. There's a couple different projects going on looking at uh, really the models, art to co-ops and northern images in terms of how they've worked through things. It's been quite interesting. I grew up in a, a small town in Alberta which is surrounded by reserves and uh, living in that context and just working with these young women now who are inspiring, self-confident, clear about what they want to do. 
uh, most of the women, of course. And um, when reconciliation comes up, they, they roll their eyes. It's another word that's come through, and they just go, oh, here we go. And I think just maybe elaborating on your point that you just made, Francine, about how do we make this a true process? Um, and and how, how do we do it in such a way where there, what I'm finding is a lot more sense of hope, of pride, uh, with, with the young Aboriginal people I'm working with, or, or older as well? And, and how do we actually turn this into something that's not just a, a phase in the current government context? So maybe talk about in terms of more hopeful terms of how to really move this forward. So I, I think that was the last few comments and Francine's point was really clear during the entire consultations, which is why if you read the report, you'll actually see that that was a very specific analysis to not define the indigenous involvement in social innovation and social finance, but to say that that is the responsibility for all of us to provide their power to determine their goals and their outcomes. And I think if, if you read the report, you'll see that that section, I think, was, was well recognized that it's not my role to define that for any community, but it's the power to empower the communities to decide that. And, and I think we tried to do that. I'm not sure we, I think we got further along toward the end than where we were at the beginning. Um, and hopefully the report does reflect some of that intention and goal. Merci pour ces commentaires. J'ajouterais que ce même respect est dû à toutes les collectivités, à toutes les communautés et à tous les territoires et provinces. Et là où il existe des écosystèmes euh, d'innovation sociale et de finances sociales et solidaires, ils sont à tenir en compte et à tenir en respect et à accompagner, bien sûr, de mesures qui aident à les renforcer, mais non pas à les doubler ou à les dupliquer. Excuse me. So, so when I think about how, you know, how we make these changes and, and what do we do and, and the whole strategy that we came out with, um, for me, we have to really roll up our sleeves and be able to some to solve some of the hardest problems, and we have to find some solutions to them. A lot of, when we talk about financing pools, like to me, the low-hanging fruit is to subsidize a house. That's, that's pretty easy to solve, and, and I think there's a lot of models out there that could do some of that. The test in this strategy is going to be, what are we doing about the murdered and missing women? That's our women, that's our kids. And if we can't find solutions through a strategy that allows for innovation, that allows for things to be separate, to, to be done uh, differently, if we can't address those issues that, that you know, we're, we're coming to know about the, with respect to murdered and missing women, that's the hard challenges, that's what I wanna solve. The, the other stuff, we'll find, but if we can't figure that out and take care of the women and their children in our communities, we're not solving anything. So, so back to, you know, to your question is, there is a lot of hope there. And the thing is, I think with the group of young men and women that I work with, and they're Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, and they're old, <laughs> there's, you know, there's older people working with us, I call them all youth because they're all, they're, um, they're doing their business with these kind of solutions in mind. They're embedding that, that thinking into the things they want to create. Um, and, and I think that's where we're, the solution's going to be. And I think the funding that goes out um, for doing projects is going to have to ha give it a lot of scope to, be able, to enable innovation to happen to enable innovation to be understood from the terms that are being expressed. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, that's the real challenge around uh, the funding elements of it. But if we do that, we're gonna come out with all kind of new um, ideas and new ways of doing business that we haven't seen before. I, I'm quite confident in that. I see it with the young people and what they're doing. So, and I'll just give you an example. As we're running all the tree planting and the organic gardens, and it, we have people involved, um, so some of the young women, what they do is, well, one of them in particular, 
um, that's part of our group. You know, she, she volunteers her time to go at two hours a week and pick lice off of the street people mm. in, our, in our community in Ottawa. And we all support her. Mm. But that, you know, that she said, no, d these are the shun people, Francine. These are the ones that nobody, you know, works with. That's my contribution. Uh, some, just yesterday, one of our forestry guys, our tree planters, took another young man with, uh, who's having mental health issues. They're gone in the bush. They're, you know, they're, they're pine cone picking. They're doing all this work with, with the idea that I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna take care of this guy. So that's how it's gonna come out. But, but how do you fit all of that into a funding model? <laughs> that's the challenge. There's another question here. I'm on uh, Lars with Ven City Community Investment Bank. Um, one of uh, Francine's comments really st stuck with me, where she said, "I worry about this being a flavor of the month." Then later she referenced, "You know, here and gone again in five years," and it made me think very much about you know taking a truly long view. Um, in reading some of the recommendations, it felt like you know many of these are also uh, Wendell Berry's sequoias. They're, they're going to take a long time to really bear that cumulative benefit. So I was curious for the, the full panel's thoughts about how do we ensure a strategy like this is truly durable um, and lasts between administrations, lasts between governments, lasts between changes and transitions in power. That's your job. I mean, really. <laughs> uh, I think that I think that that's a fair question, but but I also think that uh, we don't have any other choices. I mean, if we if if as a species, I mean, I don't think it's overstating the case that if as a species we hope to survive, we need to do things differently. I don't I don't think anybody doubts that. So so this may be a first step in the process, or at least. It's not the first step, a step in the process. And it may be that there will be changes made after this step. In fact, there are going to have to be changes made after this step. But, but it's, <clears throat> it's on you and it's on you guys and, and all of you young people, younger people in this room, all of us, to do our part and, and to, to begin the process of creating a value-based economy, one where, one where we respect where businesses and, and communities respect the people who live there, who value the communities in which they do business and their customers, who value the planet, and who, and who say that those things are important as well as profit. And I think, I mean, I think this was, a, was an honest first attempt uh, at creating policy on a federal basis, on a pan-Canadian basis, that, that moves us towards that. But it's, let's be clear, it's only a first step on a pan-Canadian basis towards that end. I'll be less philosophical and point out that in the recommendations, there's actually a cross-sector. There is legislation that talks about embedding this. It talks about implementation tools and it talks about policy. So all of those frameworks were considered. So the cross-sector stuff in terms of how do you actually start to create programs create regulations and create legislation that will help support a culture shift that we've been talking about. Because I think David and Francine and Marie all talked about, we're not talking about a short-term, Lars, you're absolutely correct, it's not a short-term thing. This is one step in an entire change of how communities control power and how communities create economies. And when we think about this as a strategy, not an answer, that's what becomes really important. And I think we're all trying to say that this is about a community economic development long-term process. And this is an interim strategy to take the next step. So I think David's right. And when we look at it from a policy change, we did try to do programmatic, regulatory, and legislative advances to move this sector forward. J'ajouterais que ce qui est demandé, c'est un appui, un appui aux écosystèmes existants 
et un appui à la création d'écosystèmes là où il en manque. Mais euh, je me questionne toujours de savoir pourquoi est-ce que maintenant on parle d'écosystème alors qu'avant on parlait de système. Euh, oui, c'est à la mode, écosystème, euh, ça fait écolo, mais quand on y pense, un écosystème, c'est résilient. Euh, ça passe à travers euh, des crises, ça passe à travers euh, des, des, des fois des changements de, de type de soutien, de modalité de soutien, mais c'est résilient. L'expérience des écosystèmes existants, vous les, vous les connaissez, vous connaissez cette histoire. Euh, il y a eu des, des moments de, de vaches plus grasses et des moments de vaches plus maigres, mais les écosystèmes rebondissent. Et donc cet appui à l'écosystème permet évidemment de le booster, de, de lui donner de l'adrénaline, mais euh, c'est l'écosystème qui va assurer aussi sa propre continuité, sa propre continuation. Well, my faith is in the millennials because they're already doing this. The, the young people are not sitting there saying, let's create a strategy and we're going to, they're, they're saying, let's go save the planet. We need to plant trees. <laughs> uh, we need, you know, the organic gardens that they're building are, are designed, they're, they're growing tea, but they're designed to attract monarch butterflies and bees and all, all these, these distress uh, little critters out there. Um, they could have sold lots more tea, but, you know, Their whole emphasis was on creating these gardens that that have all this effect, and it's going to take time to build up to the market level that they want to do. But these kids are out there doing it, and so we need to find them, and we need, we, we really need to support them in the ways that we you know we can. And interestingly enough, we just got an investment of a, a quarter million. It it was after the person who the the. For the The gentleman that said, okay, I'm, I'm going to put some money into this. And he not only gave us money, gave us land and a lot of other things. But um, it was after he heard the story of the girl working with the street people and her work with the lice. He said, I want to reward that. Or, um, and then he said, these kids are killing it. You know, they're doing it. I want to be part of them. So it's that 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 emphasis we really need to find and 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 there's a lot of young people that want to do those kind of things. Thank you. Uh, that's it. We're we're out of time. I'd like you to join me in thanking David and uh, Marie and Francine. <laughs> and, and I want to say that it, it wasn't just for today's presentation, which was I thought pretty good, but but. The, uh, the price that was paid for doing this work over the last year and a half was really high, and uh, all of these folks uh, really uh, stepped up, and it was, uh, uh, I, think it's, I think the possibility is there to make a difference. Thank you all for coming.